Good morning, everybody. It is my extremely delightful duty this morning to welcome you to this gathering of followers of the way on a most beautiful May morning that the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Whatever our surrounding circumstances may be, this morning in the presence of the Lord, we choose to be glad. Our theme for today is Be Still and Know That I Am God, The Place of Power. That statement, Be Still and Know That I Am God, comes of course in Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. It's also a very similar statement that we'll find in Exodus chapter 14, as Israel is trapped between the waters of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's approaching chariots. When Moses says to the people, you need only to be still. God will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. And so we see there those two elements, to be still before God, but also having experienced his presence and his power, then ourselves to respond with action. And Linda will be exploring these elements, I'm sure, a little later on. As always in our service, we invite you to stay muted throughout most of the service. That is simply a, a, a function of the way that Zoom operates. There will be one or two moments when I will invite you to unmute yourselves. But until those moments come, do please stay muted. Let's begin just by offering this time to our great and wonderful God. Lord, we are privileged to be able to call you Father, Abba, Daddy. You are the most wonderful Dad that anybody could have. And we are coming before you today as your children in a spirit not of childishness, but of childlikeness. To put our hands into your hands, to sit at your feet, to learn from you, to listen to you, to hear from you. Will you please help us to do those things today? And will you help us in return to give you our praise and worship, something that comes from the heart, that will delight your heart, that will be deep speaking to deep, so that we may exalt you. The scriptures say that you will be exalted in the nations, you will be exalted in the earth, and we want to be part of that process today of exalting our God. Amen. And in that spirit of exaltation, I'd like to ask Jean, uh, Jane to lead us in some song worship. Jane. Thank you, Philip. In the stillness, let's come into the Lord's presence and offer him our worship. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is He. Come bow before Him now in reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. Bends with holy fire, with splendor, he is crowned. Oh, awesome is the sight, our radiant king of light. Be still, for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. Be still for 
for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. He comes to cleanse and heal, to minister his grace. No work too hard for him, in faith receive from him. Be still, for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. His power is moving in this place. Thank you, Lord. still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am Your light, we 
bow down. We bow down. We bow down and confess you are Lord in this place. We bow down. You are Lord in this place. You are all I need. It's your face. We bow down, we bow down, we bow down, Lord, we confess, you are Lord, you are the Lord in this place, we bow down before your face. Thank you, Jane. We've invited God to come and be present to inhabit the praises of his people. Habakkuk tells us that the eyes of God are pu too pure to look on evil. And therefore, for us to approach him, we need to deal with the question of our sins, which we do through confession. So we're going to have a time of confession now, recognising that this is not about a formula of words. The Pharisee spoke many and uh, smooth words, but it was the man who beat his breast in anguish and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner who went home justified before God. So let's just prepare our hearts now to be open and honest with God about who and what we are, what we've done and failed to do and to speak these words in the privacy of our own homes, remaining muted, but as though they are our words. It's very easy with the formulas that we use to treat them as something that is just a matter of rote. These are things of deep spiritual significance and let us treat them as such. And so we say, God, our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for the times when we've turned away from you, ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us save us and help us for failing you by what we do and think and say father forgive us save us and help us for letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world around us father Forgive us, save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your son. Father, forgive us, 
save us and help us. Well, I personally can plead guilty to every single one of those. And I am so grateful that I have a sinless saviour to stand for me, to take upon him all the punishment that belongs rightly to me. Thank you, Lord. We receive your forgiveness gladly now. And I pronounce it over us. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins that we may behold the glory of his son the word made flesh jesus christ our lord amen so having received that cleansing from god for our bodies, minds, souls, and spirits. We are in a position to receive his word, to hear and take into ourselves what he speaks to us through the scriptures, the living word of God, which is active and alive today. Let's open our hearts now to receive God's word as Roy is going to read to us from two scriptures, one from, the, uh, from Daniel and the other from the Psalms. Roy, would you please lead us in the scripture reading, please? Uh, the first reading is taken from Daniel chapter 2 and the first 19 verses. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then this astrologer answered to the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, Tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king. There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends and put them to death. When Ariok, commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Daniel, wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king ask to issue such a harsh decree? Ariat then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, 
Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning his mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. And Psalm 131, a cry from the heart for, for, from, from uh, David. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with the great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a wheeled child. I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Thank you, Roy. Amen and praise God. That is the word of the Lord and his chosen instrument this morning to expound that word and open it to our greater understanding is Linda. Linda, over to you. Thank you, Philip. Well, I wonder, have you ever wondered exactly what it means to be saved? Or just how saved we are when we become Christian? Or if some Christians are more saved than others? Well, that may all sound a bit silly, but actually there's a serious point here. After all, we none of us suddenly become perfect just because we're born again. We still face problems and challenges. We can still on occasion behave badly. And things can still happen that throw us into turmoil and doubt or even terrify us. And other Christians can seem so much better than us, can't they? No problems and they seem to have all the answers. Even worse, they um, try and tell us where we've got it wrong. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Jane Austen, and one of her characters, Emma, is always trying to fix the lives of others by matchmaking. Now, this is a lady whose motives are very good, but time and again, she gets it disastrously wrong with potentially absolutely devastating results for everyone, including herself. Sometimes I think we can all be a little bit like that. We want to fix things, so we charge in, guns blazing, we're going to put it right. But we can't see the whole picture, and the results can be disastrous. A mess which could have been avoided if we had first listened to God. At our midweek meeting, week before last, we looked at the opening verses of Daniel chapter 2 that we just heard read. And what it's saying is so important that I felt God was calling us to look at it some more this morning. But a few preliminary points before we look at the text. First off, from the moment we give our lives to Christ, we come under his shield and the Holy Spirit comes alongside us to teach, heal and free us from all the things damaging our lives. For example, things that we're involved in that we shouldn't be. Addictions, past experiences, rejection, memories, resentment. The list goes on and on and on. The work of the Spirit is to conform us to Christ, that we might be set free and become fully what God has made and intends us to be, and so that God can use us. God does this very gradually, and as we respond in obedience, but he never goes too fast or at a pace that we can't handle. To see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we need to respond to God's leading, and we need to obey. Inevitably, we all face challenges in life, and sometimes these challenges will be to test us, sometimes to bring to light problem areas that need to be addressed and that we've been very resolutely avoiding. 
And sometimes, because God is doing something infinitely bigger, as with Daniel in our reading here, and what we're being called to go through in faithfulness is part of the saving, transformative and healing work that God is doing for others. But whatever it is that we're going through, if we let him, God will help and direct us and he will give us the strength. Well, that said, even so, sometimes things can happen that completely knock us off balance and that we feel we just cannot handle. Things for which, humanly speaking, in fact, there just doesn't seem to be a solution. And this was exactly the situation that Daniel must have felt he was facing here in chapter two. When something like this happens, the temptation for all of us is to panic and then to rush in and try and fix things which is 100% wrong. God loves us and knows what's happening already, and he wants to help. But more importantly, God has the answer. But God's terribly polite, and he won't usually intervene unless we ask him. There are many different ways of prayer, and they're all good. But I would suggest that the first thing we need to do when something awful or frightening happens is not to run around like a headless chicken, obviously, you might think. But instead, like Daniel, we need to seek God's presence and tell him the problem. Ask him to fix it, of course. But then we need to be still, trusting absolutely that he's heard and even more importantly, that he's got everything in hand. Okay, but why is this so important? The answer is actually simple. In God's presence, we find everything we need. Power, peace, safety, healing, understanding, direction. All of this he wants to give us. But we can only receive when we're still and we listen. And as we learn to dwell in God's presence like this and become conformed to Christ and to his will, so the spirit can increasingly work through us in power. It's the stillness that grounds effective action. So back to Daniel. Here in chapter two, Daniel found himself faced with a massive problem. Because the magicians, sorcerers, diviners, and Chaldeans had been unable to tell Nebuchadnezzar what he had dreamed, the king had decreed that they were all to be executed, literally that they were to be torn limb from limb. Very unpleasant. Now, as we discovered in uh, uh, Bible study, uh, well, our Bible studies over the last couple of weeks, the Babylonians were extremely superstitious. And things such as magic, divination, sorcery, astrology, all these things were believed to be incredibly powerful. So Nebuchadnezzar hadn't just summoned a bunch of fortune tellers and mediums. The king had sent for the Babylonian intellectual elite, the wise men. And it was this group that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had been apprenticed to, specifically to learn the languages and practices of the Chaldeans, who were the elite of the elite. So these four were actually student wise men. But the wise men had been exposed as not so wise after all, because when a push came to shove, they failed. They couldn't tell Nebuchadnezzar what he dreamed. Now, on every count, this was an utter disaster. In Babylonian culture, dreams were seen as very important. It was believed that they were the way that the gods and spirits talked to people. And the Chaldeans especially were believed to be really skilled at interpretation. We know, for instance, that they compiled massive manuals that covered just about every possible scenario that could happen in a dream. So whatever happened, they could it covered and could tell you exactly what it meant. Wonderful. 
But the problem here, of course, was that Nebuchadnezzar hadn't just asked them for the interpretation. He asked them to tell them what it was he had dreamed. And in case you're wondering why he made such an unreasonable request, it may well be because he'd forgotten. Because in Babylon, not to remember a dream was really bad news, because it meant that the spirits were displeased. So actually, this was a king here with a mega problem, and the likelihood is that he was pretty scared. But for all their learning, the wise men couldn't help. As they not unreasonably, you might think, pointed out to the king, to tell someone else the details of his dream was utterly impossible. And it was because of this that Nebuchadnezzar sentenced them to death, including the students who were still in training and hadn't, as far as we know, even been there. Verse 13 of our reading this morning, we read that the executioners looked for Daniel and his companions to execute them. Well, how unfair was that when you think about it? But what did Daniel do? Did he panic and run away protesting that this was a, a breach of his human rights? Did he head for the library and trawl through the books, the dream manuals for an answer? No, with absolute trust in God, he asked the king for time. And then he went and asked his friends to pray. And God, we learn, responded, not immediately, but in the night he sent Daniel a vision, not a dream. This was a direct encounter with God himself, which the Babylonians would have been completely unthinkable. And in the vision, God revealed to Daniel both the king's dream and its interpretation. And because of this, Daniel and his friends survived. Now let's make no mistake, what had happened wasn't an accident. This was a planned demonstration by God of his power and of the complete failure of magic. God had orchestrated the situation precisely for this purpose, so that through Daniel, the Babylonians might see and know the reality of his power and might see that he alone was the one true God. And God could do this because he had trained and knew his man. He knew exactly how Daniel would react. And Daniel, for his part, was 100% faithful because he knew his God. He may have been in Babylon, but his allegiance to God had never wavered. Now, I imagine that in this reading, we can all see parallels to the world situation today. And hopefully we feel reassured that God is in control, no matter how mad things seem all around us. But there's equally a calling to all of us to be faithful. God worked through Daniel and his friends, and he wants to work through us today so that we might be channels for his light, his love, his power into the darkness of this world. So the lesson for us here is that when disaster strikes or when we're afraid, and there are some challenging situations ahead for us, I think, rather than rushing in to try and fix things, we need in quietness and trust to go back into God's presence and ask his help. Because it's in God's presence and only in his presence that we find guidance, direction and power. And it's that that we need. And then on the basis of that, we need to act in obedience. For all their learning, the magic formula of the Chaldeans failed. And for us too, there are no magic answers or special formulae we can use that will make everything in the world miraculously right and restore order. But our God is a God of power. Our God is sovereign 
and all things are under his control. God has seen the darkness over the earth and he's moving in power. There's a sifting going on, we know that, prior to his return. A last chance for those living in darkness to repent and to be saved. As we live in the stillness of God's presence, he covers us with the shadow of his hand. In that place, we're transformed and we're safe. In that place, no evil can come. And from that place, we become a channel for God's power. So whatever might lie ahead, let's all of us strive to enter in and remain in God's presence. And let's trust and not be afraid. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda. A great reminder for us that we worship a God of power. Christianity is a religion of power, power to bring salvation, power to heal, power to uh, cast out demons and much more. And Daniel had tremendous trust, faith in that God of power. His God is our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He is the God who is the same yesterday, today and forever. And it was really interesting to see in verse 11 of that reading from Daniel chapter 2, the Babylonian astrologers saying that only the gods could reveal this secret of the dream, and those gods do not live among men. But later in Daniel, we see the Lord showing precisely the opposite as that figure comes to be with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And later, of course, we have the Lord Jesus Christ, God become man, taking the form of man for our salvation. This is the God that we worship, not the God of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians, but the God of power who made heaven and earth and everything they contain. So let's now together make a statement of our faith. It's a way, if you like, of just exercising those faith muscles of ours. We, uh, again, I'll invite you to stay mute, but to say this in the privacy of your own home. We're going to use this very excellent, very ancient and very well-known formula that's called the Apostles' Creed. Sometimes familiarity can breed contempt and we are apt to say words by rote because they are familiar with, uh, to us. Therefore, I'm just going to mix it up a little bit this morning, just to, to uh, bring the words home to us a little bit more, I hope. And instead of using we, I'm going to use I. This is my personal statement of faith, but it is also our collective statement of faith. And I might add a few bits and pieces here and there as the spirit moves. So together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That's who my dad is. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. He's beholden to nobody and he needs nobody, but he has chosen us to be his people. Praise his name. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And I am seated with him in heavenly places. And you likewise. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. That's my Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the holy universal church, the communion of saints, us as a community of believers, a congregation, a gathered people of God, to weep when another weeps, to laugh when another is full of joy, to share life together and help each other on this path, this walk of faith. I believe in the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen, amen, and amen, and all praise to my God who made it so. On the back of that statement of faith, I would like to ask Peter now to lead us in a time of collective prayer. Peter, over to you. Father God, in your, whose hand the world is held, we thank you that through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the freedom and the confidence to enter the very courts of heaven, where we can receive your mercy, where we find grace and we can experience the security and the power of your love for you, and you alone are our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Lord, may we be still in your presence to know within our hearts that you are God. Lord, we find it hard to conceive of the suffering now being experienced in the Ukraine, the result of the brutal destruction of the infrastructure. Yes, the provision of weapons have been so necessary, but now, Father, there is an ever-growing need for the basic necessities for life. We thank you for the many who have contributed so that provisions of food and clothing can be made. The greatest of these needs is for food. And Father, we pray that you will set your protection on the new initiative of the food program for the Ukraine. We pray for the volunteers, those who are serving day in and day out, many separated from their families. We pray for the hope of the gospel to be known through the practical support. And we ask that help will be available to establish communities for those who have been forced to leave their homes and friends. Lord, in the midst of the devastation, in a nation torn apart by war, help your people to come and to know that even in the midst of this turmoil, you are God. Father, may they have a quietness within their hearts to realize that you are there with them and know that confidence of being secure in you. Amen. Father, we want to just pray for the NHS, for the endeavors that they make to provide medical care. We thank you for the many medical staff who are committed to giving compassionate and professional care. We thank you for those in the very front line, the paramedics, the ambulance crews, Lord, we pray a blessing of your protection on them and their families as they frequently are called upon to work long hours and face horrendous situations. And Lord, for the resources that the NHS, the NHS have, we ask that they may be used wisely. For Lord, we must express our concerns that those charged with the management of the NHS appear to allow resources to be committed to meeting the demands of ideologies that are in rebellion against your word. Father, with many patients unable to access medical care, we pray that this situation will be recognized and addressed 
and we pray that the propaganda of these minority groups will be exposed for what it is. Lord, in your mercy, we cry to you for this. And Father, we would pray, may your will be done and your kingdom come in every part of the NHS. And Lord, for our nation, we bring the state of it before you and we seek that in your wrath you will remember mercy. Back in the recent pages of our history, you delivered us during the Battle of Britain. And now in the spiritual battle for Britain, we ask for the preparation and equipping of your people who are called by your name to stand on the foundation of truth, the Lord Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. We ask your protection, your wisdom, and your courage for our brothers and sisters in Christ who stand firm in the political arena, particularly the PM's Chief of Staff, Steve Barclay. Lord, we cry to you for integrity and a move of your spirit amongst those charged with the government of our land. And with the recent votes that have gone on in um, Northern Ireland. We pray for those members of parliament, particularly for Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, that they may have wisdom and understanding. And as you've reminded us um, this morning, as Linda has opened your word, the first port of call is to come and be still in your presence, that they may know your heart and the wisdom of your purposes. Father God, in the continued shaking of our nation and the disintegration of our culture and increasing turmoil, we ask that according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, there may be granted the treasured gift of repentance amongst us. Lord, help us to show compassion to the broken, to encourage the weak, and may our lives reflect the beauty and the character of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> I guess there's no doubt that many of us know of or have prodigals. Jesus in Luke 15, in that parable, he said of the loving father, but while the prodigal was still a way off, long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to him, he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. Let's take a moment to place uh, by name our known prodigals into God's hands. For God's grace is still available to them and God's heart remains towards them. <coughs> Lord, we bless these protocols that we have committed to you that they may turn around and head for home. Amen. Finally, O oh God, you are so immense and we so limited. We can see only so far. Therefore, we ask that when we stumble and fall, you will remind us that your love is so much greater than our capacity to fail. Call us out of our dark shadowlands into your light and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Peter.
Peter led us in a prayer for the prodigals amongst our families and those whom we know. We're going to take that on with praying also for healing in the lives of those who are dear to us. I will say some words and then there'll come a point when I'm going to invite you to unmute yourselves, to speak out before God the names of those who are on your hearts. So we bring to the Lord the sick and the suffering, those who are heavy laden and who mourn and grieve, and there are so many of them living lives of quiet desperation behind their nice little frontages, shut away, desperate, and needing God. For those who are weary, tired, and anxious, we know that God has his eye on all of them. His heart is rent for them. Their needs do not go unnoticed by our God. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ bless and restore all of those who are troubled in body, mind, or spirit that we now name before him. So please unmute yourselves now and call out to God on behalf of those you love. Spoken, but all mm -hmm. those that have not been spoken, the ones that have just been said in the hearts. The scriptures tell us that it is the goodness of God that draws people to him. And when we think about his goodness, mm -hmm. his kindness, his loving mercy, his gentleness, his yearning to restore and to heal, how can we do anything other than praise him? And so I'd like to ask Jane, please, to lead us in a song of praise. Jane. Thank you, Philip. I just want to uh, sing this song together as a response to what we've heard and uh, a response to the theme of our meeting today. I'll be still and know that you are God. I'll be still. I'll be still and know that you are God. I'll be still and know that you are God. I'll be still and know that you are God. And I worship I raise my hands to you. I stand in awe of you. I am amazed and I honor you. I place my trust in you. I place my trust in you. You are my God. I'll be still and know that you are God. I'll be still and know that you are God. I'll be still and know that you are God. I'll be still and know that you are God. And I worship you. I raise my hands to you. I stand in awe of you. I am amazed and I honor you. I fix my eyes on you. I place my trust in you. You are my God. You are my God. And so to conclude, I would love to bless you in the name of Almighty God. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you that extraordinary shalom, which is a wonderful gift, wholeness and well-being in every fibre of your body, mind, soul and spirit. May those great gifts be yours today and may you take those gifts and share them with those that you love and with the wider world. And so I release you now to go in peace in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>